Hi, it's John Kelly. In this module, we are going to discuss the new format of the audit report, mostly for public companies. That will be effective in 2017 or 2018, depending where you are in the world. And it's called Key Audit Matters, and it's section 701. And it goes under a variety of different uh, acronyms, KAM, Key Audit Matters, in the United States, Critical Audit Matters, CAM, and in France, JOA. And they're all slightly different standards, but we're going to use an example from the UK and follow international standards. And as always, we want to be efficient and effective, follow professional standards, and document what we have done properly. So I'm going to use the Rolls-Royce Financial Statements 2014, which was the first year this type of report was required in the United Kingdom. And they are considered the Rolls-Royce of Financial Statements, the best example of financial statements. And this is considered the Rolls-Royce of Audit Reports, the best example of this new form of audit report. Now what Rolls-Royce now does is they sell jet or turbine engines. And just so we can understand a little bit, jet engines need to be overhauled and it's required by regulation, though the overhaul is becoming much more frequent than required by regulation, almost annual, and that's because of fuel efficiency. Also, you need to understand that a jet turbine engine is made up of many, many, many expensive bits. And they're all replaceable, unlike a car engine. If the block in the car engine goes, you typically throw away the whole engine. There is no such part in a turbine engine. They can all be replaced or reconditioned or reused. And so when uh, an engine is overhauled, that's what's done. And once the engine is overhauled, it's effectively brand new. It has as many allowed flying hours on it as it did when it was brand new. And as a result, there is a long revenue stream if you sell engines, decades, because you're going to be selling replacement parts for these engines for a long time. Now they have two kinds of sales. They can sell just the engine, in which case they would recognize only the revenue from that, or they would sell engines and parts over uh, some long term and you can then recognize more revenue. Now, the puzzlement for accountants is the economics of the two different types of engine sales are the same, but the revenue recognition for accounting purposes is going to be different. And it's all long-term, and there are lots and lots of estimates. Now some details of the financial statements, 14 billion pounds in revenue, 60 billion pounds in profit. You can see quite a drop from the prior year. The auditors normalized materiality and you can see that that was a good idea for them because their materiality didn't drop a lot, or at least it didn't drop as much as profit dropped. And when materiality drops, that can be a problem in the audit. So that's how they got around that. Some more details, the annual report is 168 pages long and I estimated 150,000 words. I could be high or low. 56 pages of financial statements and 17 pages of an auditor's report, both of those included in the 168. And there's some novels there that you can compare in terms of just exactly how long this is to read. Um, reading speed for technical material is five minutes a page. So to read the annual report would be 14 hours and to read the audit report would be 1.4 hours, a long time. Now the definition of what constitutes a key audit matter, it's something that in the professional judgment of the auditor is of most significance and something that has been reported to those charged with governments, you, governance. You don't have to report as a key audit matter everything you told those charged with governance about, but to report it, it has to be something that you told them. And three things, three parts to the definition. It's a significant risk of material misstatement or something that in the auditor's judgment is significant. 
It represented a significant difficulty in doing the audit, including getting evidence, and it required a modification of approach, including weak internal control. So those are the three things that the auditor would consider when trying to decide what to report as a key audit matter. In the report, what you're required to do is say that these are the things that are of importance to the auditor's professional judgment. Some, but not all, of those told to those charged with governance. That the procedures done were done in the context of the audit as a whole. The opinion is not modified. You have to say why it's a key audit matter and describe the procedures you did. And you have to refer to the disclosure in the financial statements that the client has made. Now here's an analysis of what was in the Rolls-Royce audit report. Eight things, um, all things that are hard, pressure to meet targets because of the uh, nature of a public company, revenue recognition in the aftermarket is hard, revenue recognition because it's long term is hard, recovery of intangibles if you've spent money developing a new engine you presumably have capitalized it as an intangible asset. Provisions on long-term contracts are hard. Bribes, this is an interesting one because the client self-reported some bribes. These were bribes that were in the media long before the financial statements came out. And they are properly disclosed in the financial statements, but the auditor felt it necessary to describe this, presumably because sometime in the future there could be significant financial consequences and they didn't want to be held responsible for that, I guess. In the UK, there's kind of a second set of financial statements presented and uneven revenue because of all of the matters described above, revenue is going to be uneven and the disclosure of that uneven revenue was considered to be a key audit matter. So eight of those. What the auditors did in response, in four cases they made inquiries in three cases, they either test or challenged management's controls. Four times they did analytical procedures. Four times they applied professional skepticism or professional judgment. Once they used the engagement quality control reviewer. Presumably the EQCR looked at all eight of these things. And in three cases, they checked the math. Now, in terms of describing the problem or the matter, pressure to meet targets, for instance, in the report, it was stated that results are sensitive to significant estimates. There's a broad range of acceptable outcomes that could lead to different profit and revenue being reported in the financial statement, and that small changes could result in meeting or falling short of guidance. On the profit from civil aerospace, for instance, the inherent nature of estimates means that continual refinement can be significant in an individual year. And the rest were similarly described. Now we note that the work done was largely inquiry or analytical, and those are not the most persuasive tests, but in the case of accounting estimates, what else can you do? confirmation, recomputation, those kinds of tests aren't available. The other thing is the auditor described the extent of audit testing. And if subsequently a user is unhappy about that and thinks that more work should be done, should they have not complained promptly? Like when they read the audit report and said, hmm, I think more audit work should have been done, should they not have complained at that time? And if they don't complain, can they complain in the future? Because they were advised about the extent of testing. Now, when I look at the eight things the auditors described and applied the three criteria, other than they were just things the auditor felt like reporting, was there a significant risk of material misstatement? Um, no. A small fix in the first one. In the other seven, nothing really, and I would argue that for the bribes, 
There's no risk of material misstatement at all because it was properly disclosed. Difficulties encountered doing the audit, there were none listed in any of them. And modification of testing or problems with internal control, only in the third one. The rest had nothing. So the auditors were relying particularly on their judgment as opposed to the three criteria. And in the audit report also, as they are supposed to have, stated that the procedures for an audit as a whole only, that the key audit matters were incidental, there was no opinion on them. And the other thing that you can now do is you can incorporate a disclaimer by reference to your website. So they incorporated a disclaimer that an audit will not guarantee that errors or fraud will be found. Now, the first thing I ask, is there anything new in this? The only real new thing in the opinion was that they gave a positive opinion on the financial statements. The rest is all old news. The bribes were in the media before the report, and the other risks were evident before, either in the prior financial statements or in interim financial statements or in the financial statements themselves. So there really was nothing new that the auditor was saying. Then also the client provided rather a long list of risks, both in the financial statements and in the notes and in the audit committee report. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you will see there's a long list and you will see that the auditor repeated either implicitly or explicitly almost all of the warnings that the client provided. And here's another 11 that were included and they're basically all repeated in the audit report. So what did they miss? What did they fail to warn about? Well, between the auditor and the client, there were warnings about the valuation of all assets other than cash and property, plant and equipment. There were warnings about contingencies and provisions. There was a general warning on all estimates what else could you possibly have warned the users about? Very little. And then the question is, well, is this going to change from year to year or is it going to be a recitation of the same problems year after year? And will people then find this less interesting? And the 2015 report had exactly the same eight warnings that the 2014 report had in it, though they had spent more time talking and providing more detail, but it was the same eight items. Now some conclusions. I'm very interested to note that research finds and focus groups, and they've done focus groups in the UK and Canada and the United States, and the unanimous conclusion of users is that this is very, very useful information. Researchers have done research, they've used eye motion technology to find out what people's eyes are looking at. And the description of the key audit matter attracts people's attention. So users think it's terribly useful. I wonder whether this is information bias. Information bias is an element of cognitive dissonance that human beings like information and we're prepared to gather information long after we could probably be convinced that we really didn't need any more, but we love information. Now, research in the UK and France, in the UK, this has been around since 2014. In France, the JOAs have been around since 2003. And the researchers measure what investors actually did in the market based on the KAMs. And in the UK, they found that there was no information. Uh, the information was not informative and it had been previously disclosed. In France, after the first year, they found no information. So people really like it, but they're unable to do anything with it. Most recently, um, there's now a name for this, the disclaimer effect. And they found that reading a key audit matter lowers the user's confidence 
about the key audit matter. Also then the users feel that the auditor has less responsibility for the issue if they disclose it as a key audit matter then the auditor has less responsibility. And they included in this thing class action lawyers that sue auditors and initially they felt that um, the auditors had not that much less responsibility but when they were specifically asked could they be more or less successfully sued their conclusion was oh no they have significantly less legal exposure once you have disclosed the KAM and the same auditors noted in a, a same authors rather noted in a paper they wrote before this that this may urge auditors to have more key audit matters than fewer so thanks for listening